must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support. And now for the show. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. My name is Brandon Pollan, and I am one of your hosts. And of course, as always, I'm joined by my fellow co-host, F. Scott Feel. And today, we're really excited to welcome two very special guests on to talk about the published numbers regarding DPT program expenses and revenues. Now, for this episode, we are happy to welcome Joe Ranke, who is the CEO and founder of Fitbunk Inc., and Alan Fredenal, who is the COO of the Institute of Clinical Excellence and Physical therapist at Perry Physical Therapy in Perry, Michigan. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, Alan worked on a research project in which Joe Ranke helped him obtain the data in the public domain regarding the costs and revenues of US DPT programs, and we're really excited to dive into this topic. Now, I know some of our listeners are probably listening right now, and they're like, wait a second, didn't you have Joe on in the past? And the answer is yes, we did quite some time ago, Um, because at that time, Joe came on to talk about just overall student loan debt and some strategies that students and clinicians can do to really contribute to reducing their debt. So please feel free to check out the show notes for that if you missed that episode. But, you know, gentlemen, thank you both so much for your time and for your service that all of you guys have done to help advance the profession. And I really respect what you guys both have done. You know, I I recognize that there are some of our listeners out there that perhaps haven't heard of you guys. Would you mind giving our listeners some background into who you each are along with your academic journeys that led you to where you're at now? And, And Alan, how about if we start with you for this one? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate being here. Um, I am a practicing physical therapist in Michigan, um, a CrossFit coach. And uh, in addition to all that, I help run the Institute of Clinical Excellence. So I help run all of the, the logistics and back end for ICE. Very nice. Joe, how about you? Give us a little refresher on who you are. Yeah, so I am definitely not a PT. Um, <laughs> uh, my wife's the PT. I let her do all that stuff. I'm the, I'm the finance guy. I've been in finance for a long time now, over 20 years. And I created this uh, technology that helps just, uh, you know, financial plan and make everything easy to understand. And we decided to roll it out. Uh, we're trying to figure out student loan plans first and specifically in PTs. Uh, so we rolled out the first version, full version of it last September. And as of today, we have about 4,500 PTs that we've helped, uh, both students and new grads manage about $600 million of student loan debt. So we've been able to collect a lot of data over the last year, year and a half, and using that data for a lot of good things, a lot of good feedback to the programs and all that fun stuff. So that's a little bit of my background and, you know, my, uh, company Fitbucks in the PT world and that's how we are uh, in PT. Awesome Joe. Well with you coming on the podcast last year to talk on student loan debt could you maybe give us an update before we dive into the DPT program finance data. Uh, What were the latest numbers and trends on student loan debt in the U.S. and are there any new changes that are looking to take place to address the student loan debt problem on a macro or a micro level? So you know, I'll go from the bottom up on that, basically in the PT world, and then go to the broader spectrum. In general, the PT for DBTs, we see about $139,000 in debt on average on our platform. Again, that's 4,500 new grads that we have. From a macro level, everybody's like, well, is that a problem with DBTs? It's actually just on the graduate level in general that we see that across the board. And when you look at ratios, they're pretty consistent across the board of how much people have borrow versus relative incomes. And that's continuing to have a bigger and bigger gap. Um, On the macro level, is anything going to be done? Um, I don't see it anytime in the near future. I'm sure we'll talk about the Prosper Act, but 
that is so far down on the totem pole of, you know, is student loans in general so far down on the totem pole of what anything anybody is even talking about in Congress that yeah, I just don't see anything happening except for if, you know, pre, I guess you can call them pre-grad students stop going to grad school. That's to me, the, you know, what you're actually seeing um, right now. So that's, we have actually heard that quite a bit from chairs, from different programs, from just programs, MBA students, everybody across the board, just schools coming to me saying, can we need help? And it's like, well, why what's going on? They're like, we'll start to lose applicants because of this stuff. So from a macro level, that's the part that I'm starting to see. And then from the micro level, the, again, the dollar amounts about $139,000 for PTs. That's what we see. So, you know, and go from there. Yeah. Joe, you mentioned it um, briefly here, but for our listeners who are not aware, could you maybe tell them what the Prosper Act is uh, and what the current status of that act is? Yeah, so there's actually a couple things that went through, started being talked about last year. Um, so the Prosper Act was put uh, forth by the House of Representatives in December of last year. Uh, basically what it did was do away with public service loan forgiveness. And uh, the whole point was to potentially repeal it and then replace it with something else. Um, and so that was put out first. And part of it was also to, to streamline all these income driven repayment plans. So right, right now there's five different repayment options for income driven plans. And there's, I think three different or four different options for pay down strategy. So there's actually like eight or nine different repayment plans. So the goal was to streamline that to just two. And so they put that plan out and then uh, president Trump put one out. Um, that was pretty similar, um, had some differences on who would qualify, who would be grandfathered in all these different things. Um, long story short, neither one of them went anywhere. Um, I don't even think they ever brought to a vote. Um, and like I said, I don't, it's not on the, on the radar for a lot of them because it's not a major pressing issue, um, which I'm actually shocked because, you know, everybody's trying to get the vote of the younger generation, yet neither side really talks about it. Um, but that's where we're at right now with that is they've kind of just stagnated and they're not really going anywhere. You know, so Joe, I'm curious here just because, you know, obviously going off that, off that a little bit, kind of going into the act here. So hypothetically, if that did pass, would that mean a big significant change in terms of college tuition and stuff like that? Or would it not be a huge change? Well, one of the things it would do is, and this was part of President Trump's, is a lot of people blame on, for graduate school, they blame the run up of tuition prices on a bill that was passed, I believe it was in 2010 or 2012. I can't remember what year. Uh, but President Obama basically uncapped how much you could get for uh, federal loans for grad school. And I can't, I can't really say he uncapped it because you can still only borrow up to what's called the certified amount. So each school has to certify how much their programs cost. And then and that's how much in federal loans you can get um, for the students. The issue is, is that the schools, they can kind of just keep upping how much that certification is and that's what they've done so you've seen tuition really go through the roof for grad schools the last probably six to eight years because of that so one of the big things that the prosper act does i can't remember if it was a prosper act or if it was president trump's it put a cap back on how much you could get for federal loans and so trying to basically put pressure on the schools to say look stop raising prices uh, but then obviously the other side then starts to going back saying, oh, well, that means that people are just going to go out and get private loans and private loans are higher interest rates than federal loans. So that's, you know, the, the issue there is trying to fight back and forth of what would be the ramification on if they actually capped it or not. Um, and again, uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, I don't really see it going anywhere. Um, but there was one other thing too. I forgot to throw this in there because this was actually pretty significant. And I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, have you seen that they actually passed the IRS in a letter ruling for 401k contributions and matching for student loans? Have you guys seen that? I heard any? about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's going to be actually pretty significant. What it does is it, the IRS now allows companies that if you were to say your company has like a 3% match into their 401k, where like you put in the money to their 401k and they match it. Instead of you having to put the money into their 401k, they can match your student loan payment instead. So you can actually pay down your loans and still get your match without having to contribute to the 401k. So from a financial standpoint, to me, that's huge. Yeah, I'd have a heck of a 401k at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping. You know, I hope that a lot of companies will institute that. I know we're working with a company to, to use some of our technology as part of their solution for that. 
And if companies more and more start embracing that, I think that could be very significant in terms of just overall saving because that's the big thing right now with student loans is I got to pay all this stuff down. That makes it so I can't save. But if companies start instituting this piece and taking advantage of that, well, then it's like, okay, well, that helps alleviate the issue of not being able to save while paying off your loans. So hoping, hoping that gets more runway and, and more run over the next two to three years. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. And, and Joe, this is the next question I'm going to ask is kind of a big one here. And I, and I know that there's a lot of things to, to this, and I know this is not an easy answer, but just to kind of get an understanding of the university perspective from their financial side, because obviously when we look at the tuition rates, I mean, when we look at just inflation with everything, I mean, tuition for colleges has just been skyrocketing huge compared to so many other things. Yeah. So just to kind of get some understanding on, you know, why it's so high, do you know kind of how generally speaking the financial structure is of universities is to give some context no um, i can't go into the individual ones because each school is different especially if it's for profit versus uh non-profit i used to back when i was in college i was director of baseball operations for our, our program and at a public school so i dealt a lot with the finances trying to deal with you know that side of it financial aid everything and i mean it was a fight for money left and right because our baseball program was actually the only program that was profitable in the entire school and so when it came to just tuition i mean every program was in the red a lot of it had to do with tenured teachers not actually teaching all that type of stuff i mean there's a number of factors that come into that um so for a lot of public schools they even though it's like yeah we're not making that much money it's like you know, that's the big thing that I hate is basically graduate programs and graduate students are funding and paying for undergrad students. And what I mean by that, for example, it's like interest rates on your loans are based on risk. So like mortgages, car loans, it's all based on risk, more risk, higher interest rate. And so we got this ass backwards in the, in the student loan industry for federal loans. They graduate students, so DPTs, MBAs are less risk for repaying their student loans, yet their interest rates are double of what an undergrad interest rate is. Basically, the government's using the grad school students to subsidize the undergrad, and it makes no sense whatsoever, and nobody ever brings that up. And it's like, what? that's a place that we can attack a lot, because the grad students are the ones with the highest loans, like the most loans, accruing all this interest. So why is it at six? I mean, the new grad plus loans are at 7.6%. Why? It makes no sense. So that's what we see on the, on the public school side. Then on the private school side, I mean, they're private schools. So they're a business. You got to, you have to have a margin. So typically we see, you know, private schools just from what I've heard trying to get anywhere between a 20 and 35% margin, which is not, you know, a huge amount, but I mean, that's, you know, the typical amount. So that's what they're basing their pricing on is that margin. Um, and as costs go up to employ people and whatever it is, depending on what state they're in, then that can get ran up as well. So, uh, but that's just, it, again, the, the tough question, because it really just depends on the state that they're in, the, the type of setting they're in, what type of school they are. Um, it all influences that, that number of what they're shooting for. Yeah, for sure. So guys, let's dive right into the nuts and bolts of this episode here. One of the main concerns has been the growing number of PT programs across the country. And one of the concerns is that, you know, in addition to not having an appropriate number of quality faculty to fill those roles is, you know, the less amount of federal funds per program with more programs coming year after year. And, you know, Jim Gordon kind of called for this in his Macmillan lecture that possibly we need to look at programs being consolidated and having less programs in the future. What are your guys' thoughts on this? And Alan, I'd love to hear yours first. Um, I've, I've not listened to that lecture, so I can't speak to that lecture specifically. I do know that as we increase the number of programs, we're just going to see an increase in supply of PTs and just kind of basic supply and demand. As, as supply goes up, demand is going to go down. There's some research out of um, Arizona that we might see an increase in PT unemployment, which is kind of unheard of in our profession. So we might see an increase in PT unemployment in the 2020s, which of course is going to affect this whole thing. If you can't get a job, um, it's going to be tough to, to pay back those loans. It's actually interesting that, you know, two primary thoughts on that. I've actually, within our, our algorithm, when we don't release this publicly, but we ranked every program in the country, um, and some of the data that we collect continually feeds into our algorithms to update different things. 
Um, and I've talked to quite a number of chairs and they have asked me to start doing some type of surveys and polls of employers saying, is there any correlation between employment and, and some of the schools? Because like you said, it's getting diluted with some of the different schools. So is there any way we can start ranking that information to start adding that into the rankings and potentially then publish them? Um, so we have been starting to look into how can we collect that data to make it relevant and all that type of stuff. Um, but just from a pure economic standpoint, I mean, like, you know, Alan was just talking about, you know, there's a, there's a give and take on that too. So like, if you have, you know, too many programs and too much supply, then, you know, demand stays about the same. And all of a sudden you're flooding the market, you got unemployment that also puts pressure on, on incomes. And it's like, okay, well, you start flooding the market. But then on the flip side of that, it's like, okay, well, if you also limit how many schools there are, then you limit the supply of PTs, which is great because you might have some income going up. But you also start saying from the school standpoint, okay, well, we have limited seats and demand is still where it's at. Well, now tuition prices just went up because the demand's there. So there's there's this trade-off. And what's that equal balance? That's that's the big question mark is what is that balance? And, you know, unemployment for PTs is pretty low. You know, I'd still, still go out if I was the industry and still focus on saying how can we get paid more, like just in general. And that would be the primary focus I think everybody should be focusing on. But there's that give and take. It's like, okay, well, if we do it over here, what's the effect of over there? And so when we're talking about tuition prices, what would that do to tuition? Because less spots, you got demand still, you know, what are you going to do with pricing on that? So you have to look at both sides of the coin and it's a lot of research to try to come up with the right answer that <laughs> unfortunately I can't do all that research. So yeah, I'll leave that one to you guys. <laughs> no. And you know, it was really interesting. We had Lori hack on the show not too long ago. And one of the things that she said that we really need a lot more research on is about our workforce. Then the key is, are we making this decision out of true assessment of the workplace or is it kind of what other people have said throughout the podcast? Is it just more for financial benefit for the institution to make up for the other margins, you know? Yep, exactly. You know, we've talked about the debt to where it's at now and a couple other things. And I'd like to switch gears to talk about specifically the DPT program finance data. Now, Alan, first and foremost, what specifically made you decide to research this topic? Um, I started this topic when I was in PT school still. Um, we had an assignment, a group assignment to uh, dig deeper into student loans and student loan data and that sort of thing. And I'm out of breath because I'm spinning on my bike right now. That's why I sound like hyperventilating. Um, so um, to dig deeper into student loan um, debt, and we decided instead of kind of just using general sources, to kind of do some research of our own, dig a little bit deeper, um, look into not only at our own program, what, it, what is kind of the cost, what is the average student debt of our class, but to kind of try and expand it and go, go nationwide with it and get a, get a bigger picture of what's going on. Yeah, and Alan, what were your methods for collecting and synthesizing this data? Um, so we, we tried to start with every program, but we realized quickly that the, the private programs um, weren't interested in participating and that they also don't publish any of their financial data. So we, we scratched those off the list and just stuck with public programs. And from there with the public programs, uh, we, sent it, we created a list, created a list of every program and their director um, and emailed those directors and told them what we were doing and asked for their help. Um, and from there, we got some response. We got some yeses, some noes, mostly got ignored. Um, and from the ones that we did get their data, we, we plugged that into a spreadsheet. And then from there, we just we, we dug deeper program by program, um, either using some of the, the data that Joe gave us that he already had or um, looking into the financials, which, which most public institutions in most states have to publish that. There are, there are some weird states like Pennsylvania where the colleges are public-private hybrids and they don't have to share that. But uh, looking as deep as we could, pulling out how much uh, salary the faculty get paid, trying to find as much on the costs as we can, and from there kind of crunching um, a revenue minus cost number. Um, not that that number, like, like Joe said, is, is pure profit in sort of a, a traditional corporation sense, but that's kind of what's left over. What, what the university does with that is, is kind of usually out of the hands of the department, the PT department, and up to the university. And most, most universities weren't willing to share where that money went, but like, like Joe said, um, the graduate programs at most places subsidize a lot of the undergraduate programs that 
are either overstaffed or, or under attended or, or both. So um, that's kind of from start to finish how we collected that data. And then we, we threw it into one big spreadsheet and, and presented it. Yeah, you know, and Alan, you bring up a pretty good point there. You know, a lot of times the right even down to the cost of tuition for a DPT program is not even owned and controlled by the DPT department. It's, it's much higher up. Um, you know, Todd Davenport was talking about this on his episode a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, how realistically a lot of times the DPT programs are at the mercy of say, you know, somebody much higher up the chain at the, at the university. And on top of that, Janet Besner was on the show and one of her uh, thoughts and ideas on how to make things better was to possibly have PT schools becoming their own school Mm -hmm. this way that they're taking control of everything from cost down to the way they want to run it down to where those funds are allocated and where they end up going, you know, so, so the physical therapy school would be its own school as opposed to, you know, a state university with a DPT program. Yep. And that's actually, that would be a huge thing. That's actually one of the things I talked to my wife a lot because a lot of people ask me, can you think of any alternative measure? And the one I keep going back to is standalone PT schools. And then what you would do is, because I could touch on this too, is a lot of the, a lot of the problem is not necessarily the PT tuition. It, it's the undergrad and the cost of living that adds up. And so it's like, okay, well, if you look at that and that individual standalone PT school, if they partner with like a community college to do like the AA and the undergrad piece. And so basically you go from there, maybe do like a, a semester or, or a, a year at a regular uh, grad school to get your B uh, or your, uh, your bachelor's, but you do most of it at a, at a community college and you have that partnership going and it goes straight into PT school. You just trim down the cost a lot. Um, so yeah, I definitely stand by that one. Uh, Cause that'd be huge. It's just, how do you get accredited and, and all that stuff? There's a lot of a what ifs in that model, but it's something that should definitely be explored. <laughs> I'll just say from the newer graduate side, that was, that was what struck me more than, I mean, the tuition is obviously huge, but it's seeing those fees and stuff tacked on, um, especially things, you know, the whole last year is a clinical year, but paying 300 bucks a semester to use the gym on campus, which I physically can't get to because I'm in a different state or hours away was kind of just insult to injury. Um, and you can kind of see how the cost can add up with little things like that tacked on over and over again, which again, all that is like you guys said, outside of the, the ability of the, the PT department itself to regulate. Absolutely. And I kind of want to add one thing here because I feel like I had a unique opportunity back when I was in the school. So our last semester was all clinicals and our PT director actually had fought for years, every year to actually have them waive our tuition when we weren't there. And she was actually very successful with that. But she kept saying, I don't know how much longer I can hold them off. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I was, I, you know, I was really so appreciative that she did that. And I don't know how much that's, that is currently now, but I, I just remember like, oh my gosh, like that, that's huge. But, you know, I know we've gone through some of this already. And I know, Alan, you had kind of mentioned earlier that, of course, there were some limitations to this data being that had to look at public universities. And then you kind of had a small response rate from what you had told from you to kind of mention. But from asides, what, you know, you guys had already mentioned, what were the results of the research that you found? And obviously accounting for these limitations here, how accurate do you both feel that this data is? Um, I'll, I'll go first, I guess. Um, so I, uh, when I originally presented this, I never presented it to be, you know, a PhD level uh, research. Um, it was for, for a project for school. So not, not as accurate as I would like it to be. As accurate, I think, as we could get it. I think that if somebody else tried to replicate this research, they would run into the exact same barriers with, with, what struck me the most was the unwillingness of, of most universities to cooperate. We had to do some Freedom of Information Act requests on a couple of universities because they were just unwilling to, sh to share the research. They didn't have it publicly posted. It had to be kind of pulled out of them. Um, so just getting the raw data itself was very difficult, which, of course, then, then makes the actual number crunching uh, that much more difficult and then less accurate overall. So not, not a complete picture. The, the biggest gap in that research was just not having um, the costs. So a lot, of, a lot of universities looked like they were taking home a lot of revenue from the PT program, but that's just because 
they didn't have their costs published or, or weren't willing to share it. And so there, most of those, they had a big zero in the cost column just because this unknown variable that we just could not get no matter how hard we, we fought to get it. Yeah, from, from our side, um, like I said, we don't release any of the data publicly unless we know statistically that it's significant. So like we put out some different things like the average PT debt, you know, different settings, um, that information actually comes straight from us, from our profiles. So like we collect like 740 different data points, um, when somebody builds a profile and some of that, that we're triangulating is taking like some of the public information from the tuition, stated tuition versus what's out there back solving also for undergrad stuff, cost of living, how's it compared to BLS data that we have. Um, so when we sit there and, and look at the cost of living, when we look at tuition, when we look at income, those are all backed by statistics. Um, but that's also why I've had a lot of requests to publish the data and the stuff that we want to, in terms of publishing, it's all backed by statistics. If it's not, we're not publishing it. So um, on the revenue side, that's the tough thing too, is, is we can sit there and say, well, how much did you take out for undergrad or for grad school? Because we could see that data. Um, and it's not always the amount that's stated for tuition, just simply because a couple of different factors in there. One, people have scholarships and whatnot. So that decreases it a little bit, but then you also got to factor in cost of living adjustments and all that stuff too. And as Alan alluded to with the clinicals, where did the person decide to do clinicals, all that type of stuff, it all adds into that debt load. So it's not exactly apples to apples. So trying to, to bifurcate and dig through that data, sometimes it can get uh, pretty, pretty tedious, but we're collected more and more. So hopefully we can keep pushing some of that stuff out. Yeah, awesome. Guys, are, are there any other resources that you're familiar with that can tell us more about the finances of DPT programs and universities in general, or if someone else wanted to research for themselves? I have no idea. I wish there was. It would have made that project a lot easier. Um, it's, it was grueling to get even the little bit of data that we had. Um, there's no central repository for that sort of data, even, even at public institutions where it's supposed to be easily publicly available. It was uh, difficult at times to get that information. Um, I wish it, for whatever reason, it seemed to be a highly guarded secret. Um, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of public universities treated that data like, like a private university would, um, even getting line item budgets was, was even more difficult trying to see those universities that did share their cost numbers. Where did those costs go to? That was even more difficult to get than the revenue or just a general number for cost. And I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit of secret on that. It, it probably, cause it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, um, you look at like a public schools stuff. I mean, in order to get that data, you're going to have to go line by line item ledger of how the money flows through the different programs and different sections of the school. And you're never going to get that. I mean, basically all they're going to ever do is basically show one reconciled type of balance sheet or income statement or whatnot and trying to get the, the down to the T details is going to be, I mean, I bet you their accounting department, it would take them a month just to sort through all the paperwork and stuff to try to figure out where it's at. Private school is a little bit, probably a little bit easier because they get audited more often, but with the public schools, it's going to be really difficult to find it. That's why like when I talk to chairs, you know, they sit there and you know, their border regions are the ones that determine all their tuition prices and stuff. And, you know, they're like, look, we're trying to figure out where all this stuff goes to. And, you know, if we can find this information, we'll let you know. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, like, so, but just working on that side of the school in the past, uh, also my dad's company, they sell a lot of stuff to programs. So trying to, like, I've seen a lot of financial stuff from his company too. And it's like trying to find that data, it's just a minefield of uh, trying to figure out where it all goes. So my opinion, it's just because it doesn't exist. So you're not going to find it. You got to basically take public information, take data that you do have and try to extrapolate what it means from that and, and basically make an inference and do a lot of the stuff and you're not going to get the concrete data. Wow. That's really, really interesting. You know, I'm just kind of really curious because I know you guys had kind of started this thing. Is anyone else trying to build off the momentum you guys have started to work on this further? Uh, from my end, I'm not, I, not that I know of Alan. I don't know if some of the, like the students that were underneath you are trying to take it and run with it. Or are you trying to push anything through ice? So I'll let you answer that one. Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Anyone has picked it up. It was pretty um, time intensive. That was a couple months of, of data gathering and, and synthesis for what was a, a 30 minute presentation at school that we then 
um, turned into a, you know, a blog post and a live video for ice. But uh, beyond that, I don't know that anybody has picked it up and ran with it. It had some, had some mixed, uh, mixed reviews when it hit the airwaves. Um, some people said that that kind of information would, would destroy PT programs across the country, which, which obviously didn't happen, but um, it, it had some, some negative um, reviews. And then, you know, it had some, some people, you know, just like to see those numbers and, and kind of a little bit eye opening, but I don't know that it opened up anybody's eyes enough to uh, pick up the torch and, and run with it. And that's, and I, you know, I get a lot of feedback now, especially too, as, as our company gotten bigger in the industry and we're doing more workshops at schools and more presentations at SIG events and conferences and all that type of stuff. And a lot of chairs have, have asked me and sat down with me to, to go through some of their stuff to figure out what they can do. And a lot of them are just that their hands are tied. I mean, it's just nothing that they can do because it's not the decision and that's made by them. And I mean, I haven't met one chair that, is not trying to figure out something because I mean, they got a vested interest in the industry too. So it's like, you know, what can we do here? And at the end of the day, I mean, I know this cause I've worked on that, on that university side. I mean, to get just a meeting with the university, anybody you're talking three or four months that you got to try to get on the board's agenda, the board of regions, like it takes three or four months just to sit down in front of them. And then by the time anything's done, it's two years. So, you know, the chairs, they, they know that they know they're fighting tooth and nail. So it's like, you know, what all of us all have limited time. So do you spend a hundred percent of your time going on that? Cause that's what it's going to take. Or do you say, look, this is out of my hands. I got to provide for my students to give them the best, you know, just the best experience they can have at my school and make sure that they're actually getting the benefit of this training them, doing all that type of stuff. Cause that's what I can have direct control of. I don't have control of this other stuff. Right. Um, you know, so that's where I, I talk to a lot of the chairs and they're extremely frustrated because it is out of their hands. Um, and at the end of the day, most of them are PTs. So they're not, you know, academics that are coming in managing these programs. They're actual PTs. So they want to see this stuff. They, they know the ramification on the industry and they're trying to make sure that it doesn't bring it down, but their hands are really tied. So that's the, the tough part that, that I see. Yeah. And, and Joe, I, one more follow up to that, just because if there are any chairs or any faculty members listening and they're like, look, I want to be able to contribute and help my students as best as I can and realize I might, maybe not, might not be able to change some things based. And I know it's kind of apples and oranges here, and it's going to depend on a lot of different factors from the school perspective. But, you know, in general, what are some strategies that you would recommend that faculty members, directors should at least consider or some steps they should take to help to the best of their ability to work on helping students with managing the finances from their level to what they can control? Yeah. And, and this has no, I mean, obviously I want every program in the country to use us. Um, so I, this might sound really biased, but <laughs> it doesn't have to be us. It has like, this is just a general thing that programs and chairs can look at saying, how can we implement some of the stuff? And what I mean by that is, is when we go to do workshops or whatnot at at the different programs, it's not us sitting down explaining dollars and cents to everybody, all these students that makes them so happy that we're there. It's giving them just the overarching view and general knowledge and saying, look, here's a game plan that you can put together. So that way they don't feel so overwhelmed. I mean, that, that's at the ultimate, like when I have chairs ask me, what do you guys do in the presentation? It's like, I, I try to make it so that way, you know, the students aren't overwhelmed when they're graduating because they're looking at this amount of debt. They have no idea what to do whatsoever. And financial aid just wants to go in and talk about subsidized and unsubsidized loans and whatever the, that bullshit that doesn't really mean anything. So it's, it's giving them a perspective like, look, you guys can do this. You just need to have a plan and here's some general information you need to know. That's how you can start planning. And just that sense of, okay, like I get that. There's something out there. Like it's a major shift in mindset. Um, and it's like, look, you know, the program is doing something for us to help us. Instead of just saying, oh, screw you guys. Like there's chairs and there's programs that have basically just flat out told us you're not coming to our school. And I, we get those students you know, to call us anyways, because they build their profiles and just come on through the internet and they're pissed at the school. Whereas all the other ones that had us come out there that just had a simple plan. They're like, yeah, my school's great. It was awesome. They had you guys come. Like I had a great experience, blah, 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 blah. So we see the shift. So my messaging the chairs is, you know, this is a problem. You don't want your students graduating, basically going on the internet and bad mouthing your school. And I see it all the time in some of these pre DPT groups on Reddit or the pre DBT group that Joseph and, and Casey Coleman have where it's like, Hey, screw that school. Like they don't do shit. Like you don't want that as a chair. So 
get ahead of this thing and, and basically have something there to help the students. So there you can say, look, we know that, you know, this is an issue. We're trying to help you. Um, so I know it's a long winded answer, but that's the big thing is just having some type of resource there. Financial aid. I hate to tell you guys this, if you're a chair or faculty listening, financial aid doesn't cut it. Okay. So, you know, there's gotta be something different because if financial aid cut it, you wouldn't have this problem to begin with. And I don't know why they call it financial aid. It's not aid, it's loans. So it's loans. And most of the time people that are actually giving that loan out don't know anything about the loans. So it's not a financial planning piece to go and send students to. You got to have something else there in place. Yeah, I think that's really important for the listeners to know, especially because, I mean, obviously, like you had said, I remember on our first episode, you had you told us that one specific story about how one school in particular had the protests and stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, we do not want that. <laughs> yeah, they would add on to that. They didn't make it public, but that school, it wasn't the PT program. It was a higher up in the Board of Regents. They actually just got arrested for embezzlement. <laughs> um, oh, wow. So that might've been the reason why they didn't want us to come out there. But anyways, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, we've had a few, few of those, uh, just a handful of programs where the students were actually really pissed off. But Interesting, huh? Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. Wow. Interesting. You know, guys, I, I want to say first and foremost, again, thank you guys so much for, you know, your insight and the time and being able to share this stuff. Cause I think it was definitely a good discussion to have. And I think it's important to have because, you know, we'll ask you guys our last question in a little bit because, but you know, ironically, the most common answer to our last question is cost. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we felt it was kind of important to address that. And, you know, Joe, I know you had answered this question last year, but you know, of course, feel free to, Give it, a, give it a go again, saying either you're number two or if your opinion has changed, feel free to share that. Um, but here's the question that we ask everyone. If you could change one aspect of healthcare education, whether that be DPT or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? And Alan, let's, let's go with you for this one first. Um, man, I hate to even talk about insurance and reimbursement, but I think there, there's something to be said there about um, coming out of school and, and not being paid enough money to, to, to make that loan payment. Um, I think if students would know what their loan payment is three years after graduation, um, and I think this is, like Joe was saying, this is something deeper than financial aid coming in and talking about the difference between loans. But if someone came in and said, hey, you know, if you're graduating with 150 grand, you know, your loan payment is going to be 70% of your, your post-tax take-home pay. I think that would significantly change those students, how they spend over the next three years. I think that would, you know, doesn't solve the problem, but indirectly make them more fiscally responsible. Just, just knowing that it's important to, at least in the model we're operating in now, um, be as, as fiscally responsible as we can during school with students and getting them that education on the front end, like, like Joe was talking about, which will, hopefully make them more thrifty and have less of a loan balance coming out at the end. And then, and then kind of that, um, underwhelming pay they start to get, uh, they'll get to keep a little bit more of that than they normally would. So yeah, you'll, uh, you'll like this one, Alan, as a, as a side note, we're actually, um, a lot of the programs are actually having us come out to freshman or first year orientations to actually go through that stuff, including, uh, one that you're an alumni of Alan. So, um, we, we're starting to get to more and more first years that doing some of that stuff. So that way they could see that and try to take as little loans as they could and whatnot. So that way they could see those payments. Uh, but to your question, Brandon, about the one thing that I would like to see, and I don't have the solution to this because I'm just talking about the PT world. Um, you know, and I don't have the solution cause I'm not a PT. I'm not, you know, the programs, uh, but something about the clinicals. Um, you know, we, we see, a lot of kids that go out to clinicals and they under predict that how much they have to borrow when they start school by about 15 to $30,000 because they don't anticipate having to move for their clinicals, pay dual rents, all that type of stuff. So if we're going to have clinicals in that nature, be more strategic uh, on them and how they're ran. So that way that piece of the loan, that's something, you know, a lot of the stuff that we talked about, tuition prices, the government with loans, that's all out of the hands of the PT world. Uh, the clinicals are, and the MPT, when you can take the MPT and all that stuff, that is directly in control of the PT world. You guys can do whatever you want to with that. So do something around those two issues, the MPT, when you can take it and clinicals, 
Um, and personally, if you ask me again, I'm not a PT, so I can't really say this, but I'm huge on experience. And my thing is get people out of the classroom as fast as possible because the real world isn't, you know, you sitting down in a room and answering questions for a test, like get them trained, get them paid in residencies, whatever it is, like get the more hands on piece, get the academic part out of the way, go hands on all that type of stuff. Um, you know, and get them out into the real world and start practicing and, and go. Um, and again, I, I talk about that from experience. I mean, everything I've, I've learned more from actually like I'm a finance guy. I've learned more from going into investing and part of my French losing my ass on investments than I ever done sitting in front of a, you know, sitting in a classroom, listening to a teacher talk. So I, I'm huge on experience and getting that out and doing something about clinicals and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, that's where I would go with it. I was just going to say, I, I think both of those are really good answers. And I, I think that's something that needs to be looked at for sure, because we get the big issues, right? But I think sometimes there's some little details lost in some of the minutia. And I think if we don't bring those up, they're just never, I mean, it's literally like the Beastie Boys, right? You got to fight for your right to party. Well, if we don't start doing something about insurance and what we're worth and what we're getting reimbursed at, you know, student loans are going to be a much, much bigger issue quicker than ever expected. So, you know, something, something's got to be done there, but guys, I can't thank you enough for your time and for coming on tonight. Um, where can our listeners find you guys on social media and online if they have follow-up questions or just want to get in touch and chat? Yeah, for us, it's just fitbucks.com. Um, you know, if you're a PT, you want to help with your loans, just click join now, become a member. It's free. You build your profile, schedule a call. We walk through everything and help you set up a plan. It's all free. Um, if you guys just have a question directly for me, on the bottom is a contact us. Uh, it comes to a general information email and people will send it to me or you can uh, direct message me on Facebook. Uh, not always the best on Facebook because I travel a lot and the DMs tend to get just bogged down and I don't know how to use Facebook very well. So, uh, <laughs> so emails are easier, but yeah, fitbucks.com is the easiest way. And, and, uh, you know, we, we respond pretty quickly. So if you have any questions, fitbucks.com, build your profile or just, you know, send a contact to us and send us an email. For me personally, I'm on, uh, everything is, is Alan Frundall. So, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm pretty easy to find probably most active on Instagram. Um, least active on Twitter. Uh, I try to avoid Twitter personally <laughs> these days. It's uh, quite a volatile environment to be in for physical therapy. Um, and then you can reach ICE, um, every platform at ICE Physio uh, for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So I, I'm behind those accounts as well. So you can, you can get me either way. And then my email is uh, alan.friendall at gmail.com. Check in my email all day long, every day. So if you shoot me an email, I will get back to you. Awesome, guys. Well, again, thank you both so much for your time and insight and coming on. I think this is a very valuable discussion to have and share. Um, but thank you guys for everything. Yeah, thank you guys. Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate what you guys do for, for the PT world with this podcast. Thank you, man. We try our best. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.